It is sad to say that a lot has been lost. If you look at the vigor and enthusiasm that informed the Pan-African movement in the 1960s, and we normally start in the 1960s, we don't go back mm. to the 19th century, what started in the Caribbean leading to the Pan-African meetings and the much more famous meeting in 1945 in Manchester and the meetings that took place in 1958 in Accra, Ghana, 1960 in Casablanca, Morocco, and ultimately 1963 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Mm. But in those days, when you listen to Kwame Nkrumah, you listen to Modibo Keita, listen to Julius Kambaragi Nyerere, listen to Ahmed Ben Bella, listen to Gama Albert Na Abdel Nasser, listen to any of the individuals at that time, you saw the fire in them. Mm. But today, when I look at the crop of leaders who are presiding over the African continent, they are lukewarm. They are so confined to their little enclaves that they only pay lip service to the Pan-African Initiative, and that is sad. So the time is now to rekindle the spirit of Pan-Africanism, to rekindle it because it is only by rekindling that spirit that we are going to compete with the rest of the world politically, economically, culturally, and technologically. We are now in what is called the fourth industrial revolution, mm. the fifth industrial revolution, the internet of things, artificial intelligence, but we cannot afford the luxury of losing and sacrificing our culture, even as we imbibe the dividends of those technologies. You know, right now, the creed of many of our so-called leaders is greed. Mm. But if you look at the founding fathers, it was selflessness, it was sacrifice. You know, when I listen to the very casual statements of people like Mwalimu Nyerere or Kenneth Kaunda or Kwame Nkrumah or Ahmed Sekoture or, or people like Amilka Cabral, what bothered them? was the state of Africa and the state of Africanness. Then through the neo-colonial project, many of our politicians were recruited into the bandwagon of ensuring that Africa was kept in the, in the recesses of bankruptcy and poverty. Mm. And, and they lost their true north with the consequence that the continent is poorer. So when we talk about revitalization, we are saying that there is need to have a new crop of individuals, not only in the political arena, but outside of the political arena, speaking about the continent of Africa and doing things about the continent of Africa. It is not true that one must be a politician in order to create dramatic change. Mm. If you look at individuals who have caused great change even within the continent of Africa and made contribution in the 1960s, people like Czech Ante Diop, were great minds who reminded us about Africa. If you look at the, the diaspora, people like John Henry Clark, people like Ralph Abernath, uh, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr. And these were individuals who were never involved in politics as we know it, direct politics, but contributed monumentally. So all hands must be on deck wherever you are. You've got to speak the language of Pan-Africanism. And we are not naive. Sometimes when we talk about African unity, people think we are romantic. People think we are utopian. People mm. think we are romantic. We are not. We are aware of the realities and we hold the view that unity does not mean collapsing the borders only. It means that our interaction is more intimate in the arena of trade, that our interaction is more intimate culturally, that we look at ourselves as one. If political union then comes later, in the form of a confederation, it is simply putting the icing on the cake. And our diversity is our strength when we emphasize the things that unite us and de-emphasize the things that do not unite us. When we judge Africa, particularly post-colonial Africa, we are normally very harsh. The post-colonial African state is just slightly over 60 years, 66 in the case of Ghana. It will take time. This is an intergenerational journey, so I'm not worried. If out of 55 countries you have 12 that are already on board, our mm. duty is to persuade the others that this is something that is worthy of identification, worthy of giving prominence, 
someone who is going to be an optimist in the knowledge that it starts slowly, then it snowballs. When you throw a pebble into the ocean, the waves begin to spread, and that is what is going to happen. So I'm not going to judge my continent harshly. Mm. I'm going to say that we use the lesson that we have derived from the past to ensure that it informs our future. And the future, as I see it, is bright. Does it mean that we are not going to have hurdles? It is Nelson Mandela who said, when you climb one mountain, you discover that there are even greater mountains mm. to be climbed. If we have that spirit, then we are going to see an Africa that is great, not in your lifetime, not in my lifetime. It is your children's children who will talk about it, and that is my joy. In 1933, an African-American called Carter G. Woodson wrote a book, Miseducation of the Negro. We have been thoroughly miseducated. Remember that when the white man came here, whether it was French or Belgian or Italian or German or British or whichever word, they had an education system that was meant to produce a man and a woman mm. who was going to serve them. That is why post-independence, Kwame Nkrumah says that Africa needs a new man, a new woman who will think differently. And what I'm therefore saying that the time is now for us across the continent of Africa to look at our curriculum and ask ourselves what are we teaching our young men mm -hmm. and women? Decolonize education. I remember in 1967 when Limu Julius Kambaragi Nyerere was being interviewed about education. And he said, the education that we have and we inherited from the white man teaches us to run away from ourselves. We must have an education that teaches us to have self-esteem, to love ourselves. That does not mean that we reject good ideas from others. It is Ngugi Wathiongo in his book, The River Between, who tells his chief character, Waiyaki, go out there and learn the way of the white man. Bring the good things that he teaches you and reject the bad ones. If we are that clever, that discerning, we can learn from the East, learn from the West, but make sure that is domesticated and responds to our realities. That is what wisdom is all about. Discernment. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like and subscribe for more videos like this. Till next video, take care.